Flying Zoo and Aquarium Species Susceptible to SARS-CoV-2. Today's presenters are Dr. Jessica Siegel-Willett, a Senior Staff Officer for National Policy Staff Animal Care, Dr. Stephen Recan, a Public Health Veterinarian Medical Officer for APHIS Veterinary Services One Health Coordination, Dr. Lori Gage, a Species Specialist for APHIS Animal Care, Dr. Susan Schreiner, a Research Biologist for National Wildlife Research Center, and David Bergman, the State Director for Wildlife Services in Arizona. This webinar is being recorded, and you'll be notified when the recording is available for viewing on the APHIS YouTube channel. If you have questions during the presentation, please submit them via the question box, and we'll get to them at the end of the presentation. If you'd like to ask your question directly, please use the raise hand feature, and I will unmute you during the Q&A portion of this presentation. I will now turn it over to Dr. Jessica Siegel-Willett. Great, thank you, Dave. Hello, and thank you all for joining us today. We hope you will find this presentation of interest and relevance as it relates to SARS-CoV-2 in our zoo and aquarium communities. So for those of you not familiar with the American Rescue Plan, Congress designated funds for APHIS to conduct surveillance for SARS-CoV-2. APHIS then developed a strategic framework that focuses first on developing a robust SARS-CoV-2 surveillance system and also builds capacity for surveillance for other emerging zoonotic diseases. Our goal is that through thorough surveillance in susceptible animals and building an early warning system to alert public health partners, we can take steps sooner to prevent or limit the next zoonotic disease outbreak or global pandemic. This is a multi-year effort. The first year will focus on susceptibility, transmission and disease processes, and communication and outreach with our partners and stakeholders. APHIS will later focus on strengthening measures for early detection and prevention of future emerging and zoonotic diseases at the human-animal environmental interface. Framework is divided into four focal areas that you hopefully can see here. Hang on, something's going on with the mouse. There you go. Um, so there are four focal areas that you can see here. Uh, prevent, detect, investigate and control spread, and communication and outreach. Multiple projects are currently being discussed and developed under each of these strategic focal areas. Briefly, we have teams of subject matter experts from across the agency discussing potential surveillance projects and the roles and responsibilities for each of the APHIS units. Today, we're presenting on a recently funded activity regarding SARS-CoV-2 in zoo, wildlife, and aquarium species. The goals of our project are to assess zoo and aquarium species exposure to SARS-CoV-2, best practices in terms of biosecurity, and what risks peri-domestic wildlife on or around facility grounds may play. We hope that lessons learned from this study could be used in future infectious disease outbreaks to further guide the zoo, wildlife, and aquatic animal communities. This study will use a three-pronged approach as noted here. First, wow, sorry, this mouse is crazy. Um, first, we'll look at serological evidence of exposure. We're hoping to enlist somewhere between 30 to 50 facilities that are willing to participate and that ideally would be able to provide somewhere between two to three samples per animal, representing time periods before and during the pandemic, as well as after vaccination. In total, we're looking to test anywhere between 2,000 and 6,000 samples, and we recognize that not all facilities will be able to provide multiple samples from each animal. 
In addition to the serology work, we'll be developing a standardized assessment tool to do some on-site evaluations of biosecurity measures used at the same facility. This will be done to assess which particular practices may have been of most use or where we may need to make changes to existing protocols. Lastly, we're looking to sample peridomestic animals on or near zoo grounds at a subset of interested facilities. We hope this project will be of value to our community as it will help inform us all to be better prepared moving forward. There is no anticipated regulatory action, no chance of animal depopulation, and participation is completely voluntary. Costs of sample shipment, storage, testing, and analysis would all be covered through the ARP funding. There will be designated individuals and groups to coordinate and assist with communication between us and participating facilities, as well as with the media, the public, et cetera. Results will be reported to individual participating institutions and later more broadly. We also hope to collaborate with facilities that may have similar projects already underway so as not to duplicate efforts. And we plan to collaborate with public health groups as we explore the human and occupational safety components associated with this project. Finally, we're continuing and establishing new partnerships with state governments, zoos, aquariums, wildlife facilities, the Zoo All Hazard Preparedness Group, and other federal agencies to ensure we have a fully coordinated One Health approach to this project. In terms of data security uh, for the serology results, biosecurity assessments, et cetera, each facility will be able to access its own information, and no facility will be able to access another facility's information. Summary data in the more broadly reported uh, report will not include information to identify individual facilities. In terms of timeline, We'll be selecting interested facilities for participation in the spring of this year. Germ sample collection and biosecurity assessments are planned for spring through fall of this year, and peri-domestic wildlife sampling will be done seasonally. By the end of this year or early next year, we aim to summarize our findings. Now, obviously, these are not hard and fast timelines, but a rough guideline for project execution and completion. In terms of which animals we're looking to test, it will be based on those known to have had infection or which were confirmed susceptible, also sister species that haven't been tested yet, potentially those species known to have the ACE2 receptor, and then those species not previously tested but which may be of great importance based on their status or use, such as critically endangered species, high-profile animals, as well as those used in human-animal interactions. In terms of the wildlife sampling, the goals are to characterize peridomestic wildlife found on or near zoo and aquarium grounds, then test those species for exposure or infection, and potentially track their movement on and off ground. To do this, our wildlife services team hopes to do intensive sampling on a subset of three to five zoos or aquariums, and then a more broad, less intensive approach at a larger number of facilities. Trapping will involve physical traps used by wildlife services staff on ground, as well as possible camera traps. And please be aware that wildlife trapping is not necessary for participation in the other parts of this project. Facilities will be selected to participate based on their interest and willingness, as again, this is completely voluntary. Ideally, facilities looking to submit serum samples and participate in the biosecurity assessments would also be willing to participate in the wildlife sampling if possible. We'll also look at the animal collection at interested facilities in terms of its size, composition, sample availability, vaccination status, et cetera. And then we'll look at things such as facility location, that is, is the zoo or aquarium in a more urban or rural area, and what state or region of the country. So if you're interested, I ask that you please contact Jeremy Ellis or Susan Schreiner at the email addresses listed here, and these were also included in the flyers that were sent out prior to this webinar.
Finally, I wanted to let you know that we'll be sending a very short survey that we hope you will complete so we can connect more directly with interested facilities. And at this time, we'll take any questions or comments that you have. Um, I'll ask all of our project leads to come back on camera. And Dave, you can guide us through any questions that may have been submitted or folks can ask them directly. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jessica. So we currently have no questions in the question box. If you have a question, please submit them via the question box or you can raise your hand and I will unmute you and you can ask your question directly. Oh, I have one person raising their hand right now. Go ahead, caller, you're unmuted. Thank you. Thank uh, you. This is John uh, Cardam from Zoetis. Zoetis. I was wondering I what was wondering will be the serological assay that you utilize to evaluate uh, responses? And specifically, will you be looking only at responses to the spike antigen, which may be confounded by vaccinated animals, or will you also be looking at secondary uh, DIVA targets, such as the uh, N or M proteins? I think I can take that one. Um, this is Susan. Uh, we're gonna do an initial screen uh, using the GenScript assay, which will be targeting spike, um, but that will just be the screen. And then if we have positives, um, then we will do virus neutralization testing. And if we need DIVA, we hopefully, we're hoping that we'll be able to, uh, you know, have the background on the sample so we'll know which ones are unvaccinated. And then we hope to work with some uh, federal partners to use a DIVA assay for those. We also have the possibility, if we know the history of those samples, if we get pre-vaccination samples, we should be able to detect a change using zero dilutions and uh, whether or not we detect a boost um, in with the gen script. So we have a, a few options there um, if we get positives. Okay, thank you. Okay, we have another you. caller. Have um, caller. Uh, Jenny, go ahead, you're unmuted. <laughs> I just wanted to know how long the study was. Could you hear me? I didn't hear how long the study would last. I believe she asked how long the study would last. Steve, do you want to take that one or? Sure. Yeah, so uh, you showed the rough timeline, and in general, we're looking to get things really spun up um, in the spring, and the final report would be coming, um, frankly, about, about a year from now, in uh, next, uh, next winter. Okay, thank you. And we'll go to some of the written questions. Is there a species list that we can view to determine whether we have the species of interest. Okay, let's uh, see again. We haven't developed any sort of specific checklist. We're working with um, internally and some federal partners, but also with um, going to be working with uh, some folks in the zoo community to identify the broad groups that are prioritized for testing. Um, I think we're going to have some sort of basically a hybrid approach of what we're looking for. Again, you just pointed out the, the species, the groups that we're thinking of, but also working with you, helping uh, answer the questions you might have. If these are important animals to your collection, to the community, um, there's not going to be a kind of a hard and fast only species and definitely not this species necessarily. Um, the, the broad groups approach. 
Okay, thank you. Next question. Do serum samples need to be stored in a minus 80 degree freezer? I can take that one if, if you'd like. Um, you know, optimally if for long-term storage, the samples have been in a negative 80, but the antibody should be quite stable. Um, so if the samples have been at least in refrigerated storage, negative four or, or four C, that, that should be fine. Um, but if um, there are different storage conditions, uh, it would be it would be helpful for us to be able to know those storage conditions so that we can we can account for that if we do see any changes. But generally, as long as they're at four C and it hasn't been too long of a time horizon, the sample should be fine. Okay. Thank you, okay. Susan. Thank you, Susan. Next question. Next question. Uh, how, uh, how, sorry. How do you I, see uh, findings drive actions to protect our collections? Could you sorry, David. Yeah, I'll, I'll repeat it. Uh, panelists, if you put yourself on mute, unless you're uh speaking please um next next question is how do you see the findings drive actions to protect our collections the general thrust of this project is looking at serology to identify a history of exposure so kind of a, a proxy for what might have happened with regard to disease on the facility knowing that again serology is retrospective when we're talking about exposure we're going to get a sense of generally what might have happened. And uh, consistent, uh, alongside that, we're going to have those biosecurity evaluations to look at what practices facilities might have employed. And even independent of practices, just what characteristics are different about different facilities. Um, we look at those two general groups and, and fold in the what we find from the wildlife trapping and testing. We're going to try to get a sense of, frankly, what has worked, what works for SARS-CoV-2. And again, try to put these all in context to see how it's um, potentially applicable, not just to this disease, but, but beyond. So it's going to take, again, going through and identifying where there might be differences, or even if we don't see differences, I think, um, again, circling back to those results and trying to figure out why um, why we got to them. But it's, it's going to take, again, understanding the history of exposure and a sense of what uh, practices were in place and when. And again, other characteristics that might involve, uh, might inform um, the exposure part. Okay, thanks, Stephen. Next question. Do you plan to reach out to the wildlife rehabilitation community? Uh, I guess I can take that. We, um, we probably will, if, if there are wildlife rehabilitation facilities that are interested in sharing the, uh, the samples that they may have, it, depend, it depends on the wildlife and the sorts of samples that they have. We may be including one or more of those sorts of facilities. We, may, we have considered including, for instance, a marine mammal rehabilitation facility if, uh, because of the number of samples they probably have available for us to take a look at. We are interested in a lot, a broad spectrum of species to see how this virus is moving. And so we very well may consider a wildlife facility. Um, so just it, we're just gonna take, try to take a look at what sorts of species that facility has, samples that would be available to us, and then we would decide. Okay, thank you, Lori. Next question. Uh... Will you manage samples from vaccinated animals separately? I'll start, maybe Susan um, can jump in about the serology part. I think that you know, with any of the samples that we're hoping to receive from the participants, they're all gonna have the information about when it was collected and information about the animal, especially for purposes of this question, if it was before or after vaccination. I think with the, that information, we'll be able to, to assess these samples and, and you know, make sense of the laboratory results. 
I don't think there's any particular need to handle them um, differently from, from the outset, but of course, as we were talking about earlier with respect to the assay, um, knowing that clinical history is going to affect how we uh, might interpret the results, but they'll be tested in line with, um, with, with the samples as, as everything else in the project. Okay, thank you, Stephen. Next question. Uh, thank you. Please repeat how many samples are needed per participating individual animal, and what is the desired time frame between blood collections? So I'll start, and again, folks, jump in if, um, uh, to, to clean up. Um, so I'll start at the facility level. Actually, we're looking for on the order of 30 to 50 facilities to participate. And within there, again, we've got some rough statistical side calculation on the front end, but it's going to really depend on the facilities that want to participate and their collections, but looking at roughly 30 to 40 animals per facility. And then for each animal, because, you know, because serology is just a point in time, we're looking for the it, looking for two samples, possibly three for vaccinated animals. We want the latest serum from before the pandemic. Uh, again, ideally that should be negative for all the animals. Um, and then we're looking for a serum sample selected during the pandemic. Later is probably better, but again, that's gonna be particular to the what is in the collection, um, uh, what is in the, the set of bank samples that is, and the animals under your care. And then for animals that have been vaccinated, one sample following vaccination. As just said, the participation, having those two samples or having those three for vaccinated animals um, is not an absolute requirement to participate. I think we're eager to learn a whole lot about the animals under your care and only having um, one or two of those couple of samples uh, is not gonna preclude people from participating. But again, that's what we're, we're aiming for, at least two samples per animal and three in vaccinated animals. Okay, thank you, Stephen. Next question, who's responsible for collecting the serum samples, the zoo staff, APHIS personnel, or both? Well, I think I can take that one. <laughs> so we're looking for samples that the zoo has already collected. So it would be the zoo staff. Uh, APHIS, uh, our job would be for it to provide you the means to get the samples to the appropriate lab. Um, and then if we, what we will do, the other side of this project is to take a look at your biosecurity. So you would have <clears throat> APHIS staff coming to your facility and, and looking at how you've managed your biosecurity throughout this, uh, this time with the pandemic and we can uh, assess that. So that's what the APHIS personnel would be doing on site. And then also uh, Dr. Shiner's group uh, on a very uh, much smaller subset, uh, we would be looking at the paradomestic sampling. So then Dr. Shiner could talk about that a little bit. Okay, thank you, Lori. Next question, would we be able to get a copy of this PowerPoint or summary of the information in it? Yeah, we've talked as a group coming into this um, about taking the questions you all asked and this presentation, trying to put together a bit of a handout with uh, the summary, some of those key findings, or key um, details rather, and also summarizing some of the, the questions that pop up frequently or the important ones. Um, I haven't heard that, but if you've got the invitation here, um, then you can uh, look for some uh, tool after this, both for for you to check your notes, but also to share with any of your uh, partners who might have been able to attend today. And as uh, was said at the outset, this is going to be uh, recorded and posted, uh, I think, about a week or so after after today. Thanks, Stephen. Yes, and that's correct. And uh, the next question kind of goes along with that. Will we be able to view this at a later date? Uh, yes. Um, we're going to post this on the APHIS YouTube channel, so you'll be able to we'll distribute a link at some point in time so you can go back and view it. Uh, next question, could you please discuss sampling protocols for paradomestic wildlife? 
will a bank of material be established? Will facilities have access to other information from these trapped animals, such as the presence uh, or absence of uh, con concomitant disease? Uh, who would manage those animals' samples? I can take that one. Uh, so uh, we're taking a two-part strategy for doing paradomestic sampling. Um, and the zoos where we're doing a little bit more intensive sampling will also have camera traps, so we won't have associated samples. But for the other animals that we capture and we collect the samples for and do the testing on, um, at this point, we're only going to be screening for SARS-CoV-2 either uh, infection from swabs or serology. Um, so we won't have information on other um, uh, other other pathogens that might be present. Uh, if there was an interest, you know, we might have the possibility of working with you. Normally when we take the samples in in this way, they would become part of our wildlife archive with a pretty extensive archive of samples um, that we maintain for and, and those samples are available. Um, if people have an interest in getting the samples. Um, I think if the, a particular zoo had an interest in the samples, we could, we, we don't have a current plan, but we could likely split the samples um, if they wanted to do additional testing on, on those samples. But we, we haven't worked out a process for that. Okay, thank you, Susan. Next question. Uh, I apologize if I missed this. Do you want serum samples from animals that are not vaccinated as well. Yeah, we certainly do. Um, we know that for a variety of reasons, there are going to be individual animals at facilities and also whole facilities that haven't vaccinated their animals. And that information is all going to really help us uh, perform the analysis, but it's going to be really important to have that, that range of information. The short version, yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Next question, if facilities are selected to participate, will you be requesting samples from specific species individuals or will it uh, be based on what is already available or accessible at the facility? I guess I can take this. I, yeah, the, I think, our, oh, go ahead, Stephen. You take it. <laughs> you can go, Lori. They haven't hurt me enough. All righty. Well, our, 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 our plan initially is to take samples that are already uh, available at the, at the facility. Uh, we may, it may work out that you would be doing some examinations on the animals during the, the course of our, our study and could provide us samples that are you know, not previously frozen. But presently, our, our plan is to take samples that already exist, that you already have in your freezer. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question, could you expand on what sort of survey or site visits would go along with the testing and what you hope to achieve with this part? Yeah, I'll start and again, folks um, pick up if, uh, if they're hold here. Um, we've got some general cybersecurity questions, I think. Some folks on this call are aware of a, a tool is that they're looking on the occupational health side of things. So looking at tools like that, but also looking at some of the just general patterns of, of movement of people and animals, how many interactions animals might have had, be it in a, a regular um, course, a, a kind of their regular course for care, but also particular incidents if animals had to uh, be hospitalized or transported, just other opportunities for potential exposure to SARS-CoV-2. So looking at animal movements and the exposure, but also trying to get information about policies with regard to um, whether masks were required, what level of masks, if there were um, enforced distancing for, for patrons and visitors, uh, and other just other factors. Again, this tool is still coming together, but the, the focus is going to be on the exposures to those animals um, and a sense of, again, general demographics. This isn't trying to identify where someone didn't wear their masks right or that kind of thing. It's really just understanding what policies 
were and, and weren't effective and what practices and other things might distinguish uh, different facilities as a way to inform others to, to help prevent transmission in the future. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question. It will the will the biosecurity assessment tool being developed for this project be shared with partners? Yeah, I think the um, you know the plan is not to uh, just have folks kind of ducking behind a clipboard and asking questions and not really sharing it out. This is again going to be a collaborative process to try to get the best uh, best answers we can here. Um, the form that it finally takes, we'll have to uh, see if there's a uh, either a different form or a hybrid between one that's optimized for data collection and entry um, back into our databases. Um, versus something that is kind of readable and understandable um, outside of that data collection side of it. But um, if not the explicit questions, then certainly the, um, the spirit of those questions and some tools to help uh, the facility answer them are going to be shared. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question. I was curious to know if you were involving wildlife shelters uh, from Washington State here, and we have been practicing surveillance regarding many of these species for over a year now? Uh, if you are interested in sharing uh, your, your serum and, and, and um, working with us on the biosecurity aspect of this, we encourage you to, um, to send in your, uh, to, to answer the survey questions and, and give us a little more information about yourself. And we will certainly consider uh, a facility, a uh, wildlife facility in Washington. Uh, but we have a lot, we don't know how many people are gonna respond to this. And it just depends on how many facilities in Washington, for instance, respond. So we'll, we'll just, we can't make a promise, but certainly it we would be, we would certainly consider a facility like that as a part of this study. Okay, thank you. Just a minute, let me pull up another question here. Just a minute. Hold on just a second. Okay. Next question. Uh, would you be interested in samples from animals that have been confirmed, infected, um, and then recovered? Yeah, certainly. Like I said, with each of the each of the animals that are going to be part of this, that uh, you are sending samples um, in for, understanding that clinical history. Um, we talked about vaccination being one of those critical points. But as you know, there have been, uh, uh, I don't remember offhand, on the order of 150 or so animals in facilities like these that have been confirmed with active infection. And understanding that is really going to help us um, analyze that, that information. Again, looking at serology, certainly from before that infection, like we said, looking for, uh, uh, for that pre-pandemic sample. And then again, understanding the potential exposure, obviously this the animal in question, if we've had confirmed exposure, we've got some more dates around that, and that's gonna really help us understand, uh, it, we can fold that in analysis some. But if we've got serum samples after that, understanding what happens after uh, that recovery is, uh, again, not necessarily the main line for us this, but really a good bonus from um, the mechanism we're gonna be setting up to do some of the testing. Okay, thank you, Stephen. Uh, given the high value of serum samples in zoos, specifically pre- and post-vaccination, the efficacy study regarding production of antibodies post-vaccination is important. Is this going to be a focus? If not, samples may be too valuable to submit. Yeah, we totally understand that. Um, 
And like we've talked about, this is going to be a, a subset of the folks that are interested, of the facilities out there that have um, and, and some that haven't vaccinated. One of the one important parts of this project really early on, if they get a survey, they really get a good sense of what other work is going on. We have no illusions that we're the only people looking at this. We know all of you have been giving this a whole lot of thought. We heard from the, the asker just a moment ago in Washington uh, and their broad coordinated activities that are in this space. So um, I, I think that we're going to get some of this information, but I totally understand and appreciate that these are not samples that um, are replaceable and this is one potential use for them. So when we do that kind of coordination, understanding what other work is going on, we, um, we're not going to then act as a site and to take up the samples that we expect are important. If we can connect the facilities are participating and achieve our goals with this biosecurity assessment and wildlife um, testing and characterization and compare that to the zero prevalence. If we can also connect people to other important studies that are going on that doesn't affect the study we're doing, but really can help some other ones, we'll certainly make those connections. Okay, thank you, Stephen. Uh, next, I know a report will be made in one year, but would there be a would there be further studies and publication in peer-reviewed journals uh, be made? If if so, would cooperating facilities be considered co-authors? We don't currently have plans to do kind of uh, midstream publication of any of this. I think that what we might find, though, is with some of the test results, for example, a chance to look into more work. To um, not we're not talking about pivoting on this kind of project, but looking at that as a place to branch off, to use some results that we find at a particular facility or maybe even across a few of them to look to see if there's potentially more work. And then, of course, we'll be in touch with the um, cooperators there. And we'll be working with the, the folks across the federal government and um, the zoo community. So understanding who might dig into that kind of work. You know, the, the focus of this project is we're trying to keep it pretty pretty narrow, pretty lean on this particular um, question. But we know that there are going to be questions that come up from this work, and we're certainly not going to wait until a year from now to, to let those things get started. Okay, thank you. Next question. Uh, are serial positive exam or samples reportable, and will they therefore require uh, confirmation confirmatory testing at state labs and NVSL. Yeah, thanks for that. This is one of the things we really had stressed from the beginning. The assay that Susan's talking about um, and if you're performing this serology, these are not confirmatory testing. This is not reportable. Um, broadly, it does not meet the USDA confirmed case definition. So there will not be reporting on these samples. We will not be reporting on these samples um, from the positive based on part of the study. If folks want to pursue additional diagnostics, we'll certainly be able to connect the facilities to that. But from this particular study, we do not, we're not expecting to have any reportable results um, as far as case numbers uh, for reporting any of the positives um, from this because the assay we're using because of the approach that we're using. Okay, thank you. Uh, what volume of serum is needed per sample? More is always better. Um, uh, but, but we can work with a, a pretty limited amount of, of sample. Um, if we do have, you know, a understanding that, you know, samples, um, you know, have, uh, have other analyses that you know the, the zoos are going to be interested in uh we we would want potentially if there was a new species that was identified we would probably want to move on to do our screening assay we need only 50 microliters but we would want to move on to a virus neutralization to confirm that result to make sure that there is no cross reactivity um, and then we would probably want a little bit more for a vaccinated animal just so we could run the diva assay and so um, we could get away pretty handily with 100 microliters, but uh, probably 200 microliters would be optimal. We haven't come up with a, a final protocol for that. Thank you. Okay, 
Thank you, Susan. Uh, next question, are any taxa of particular interest, felids, apes, cervids, or also species in which SARS-CoV-2 has not caused illness? Uh, yes, we're interested in all of those. Um, we, we want to see, we know the species that, you know, we know that felids have been particularly hit by this virus. But we're really interested also in whether other animals that showed no clinical signs might actually have developed antibodies to the disease. So, and it would be interesting for us also, and I think for the zoo as well, to see what the proximity was of the animals that did test positive but never showed any clinical disease. So we're looking for, a, we're throwing a broad net. We're interested in all different species, but we certainly are interested in the species that we've already seen the virus and it's been reported by a number of the different zoos already, but we are also interested in, um, in the species that we have not yet identified as being uh, sensitive to this disease. And I don't know if one of my colleagues has more to add to that. Um, I, I, I wanted to actually just go back to my last answer. So Steve, if you have something to add, uh, keep that in mind. Um, just because I just said that if we had a new species, like what uh, in respect to sample volume, that we would want to, you know, we're going to do a high throughput screening assay. Uh, but then if we had a new species, we might want to do a virus neutralization test. I said for confirmatory testing, I want to uh, just point out that I meant that in a generic sense, just to corroborate our, our results. I did not mean that in a case definition confirmatory. So I just should have been more careful with my words there. So since, since I said it, I wanted to backtrack. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question. You state zoo animal samples obtained during pandemic later is better. What is the de defined time for the pandemic and or what is late considering the pandemic is ongoing? I am not going to put on my public health hat and think about where we are relative to the um, potential end. So late is more um, a, a reference to to recent. I think um, the the start I think is pretty generally broadly defined as around March 2020. Um, if you have samples from around that time, then we can certainly work with you to figure out if we might try to slot them into a pre or or mid pandemic bucket. Because obviously, um, uh, the March 2020 is when we had to think about a lot of things starting to shut down. But there's evidence of disease earlier in some places and later in some other places. So um, we're going to have some again, you know, general guidelines when we talk about this. But for for each of you with your particular situation, we'll help work with that with you and the dates on those samples to determine which which bucket it's it's, um, it's going to fit into. Okay, thank you, Stephen. Uh, next question, would a facility be required to participate in all three areas to qualify? If we don't have pre-COVID serum samples, but have a lot of uh, paradomestic wildlife nearby, could we participate in one section, but not another? Uh, well, the short answer the short answer, yeah, if you, I, I, know, I know you will not be able to participate in this study if you only want to look at paradomestic species. We really want to pair the, the findings we have from the paradomestic species with, and the intensive view of those will be just three to five of these institutions, and then maybe another 20-ish, Dr. Scheiner. But, um, so we're not looking to have somebody only do the paradomestic. You, you're, we're really needing to see the serology and then the biosecurity part of that. Uh, and then a few of you will participate with the, with the paradomestic species um, uh, part of the study. And then Stephen, you had something to say. That was perfect, Laurie. I do want to add, uh, like we said earlier, we're not the only folks doing work like this. I think that the, the work the questioner asked about is, is still important. And if you have questions about that, we can try to connect you with folks who might be a better fit for, for that kind of work. You know, as Laurie said, for this particular project, 
um, we're expecting all participants to do at least some serology and have the, the on-site biosphere assessment and then a subset of the facilities participating in the wildlife side of things. But if you have a question, uh, something you're trying to do that doesn't fit within this project, we're definitely help, uh, happy to help you connect to, to folks who might. Again, we know that the, the five of us and all of you, um, you know, this is not the only project by a, a long shot looking at SARS-CoV-2 in, in these animals. Okay, thank you. Next question, best guess, when and where will survey results be available? The when is uh, a year from now, give or take a little bit. Uh, the where is a little more uh, tough to nail down at the, at the moment. As you heard Jess talk about in the, in the presentation, this is part of a, a really broad approach that APIS is taking to the American Rescue Plan funding. So consistent with that, there's gonna be a lot of communication support, a lot of places to find active work that are under ARP, not just this project, but many others. So uh, the, I guess the short version of where is I'd expect somewhere on the USDA website, but there's gonna be some areas devoted to talking about the work that we do under ARP, including this project. Um, and uh, just to add to that, depending on the, the specific nature of the question, that the lab results for individual zoos will be made available back to those or aquariums or other facilities, They'll, those results will be uh, available on a quicker timeline for, for, for the individual facility, not the general results. Yeah, that's a great point. And each participant will have, each participating, participating facility, there we go, We'll have access to their own results really quite quickly, but that broader public report will be about a year from now. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question. I apologize if I missed this, but given the interest in uh, parent domestic species and their interface with domestic dogs and cats and feral cats would in turn contact their owners, caregivers, the public, is there any parallel surveillance of domestic animals ongoing and should we find feral cats with or without collar in our hands are they to be tested if not why i'll start with the first part about broader surveillance and then i'll turn you I'll turn it over to you because the uh, i think feral cats are um, uh, in particular a question you all deal with with um, some frequency. As part of this particular project, there is not any um, parallel uh, surveillance efforts, again, st specifically tied to this in companion animals and the humans surrounding the, the zoos uh, and aquariums, the participating facilities. That's not to say we're not going to um, be plugged into the people collecting that information because there are Plenty, there's plenty of people going out and getting their own testing, people getting their pets tested, and there are definitely other efforts under the American Rescue Plan to look at uh, some of these questions. But as part of this particular project, uh, again, we're trying to keep that focus pretty narrow. So that next level of, of transmission to, uh, to the companion animals that might be in the area and to the humans in contact with those companion animals, that is outside of the scope for this particular project. And I, I can add to that uh, with respect to companion animals, um, if we're trapping at a facility, we always uh, do initial discussions to make sure that there's no chance of uh, capturing pets. If there is a chance, we make sure that um, anyone who's associated with those pets understands what we're undertaking. We can't necessarily keep them out of our traps. Um, uh, we, we would just release, we don't have um, purview for, for sampling companion animals. Um, the feral cat question is a, a little bit trickier uh, with SARS-CoV-2 because we know that feral cats, well, domestic cats are susceptible to SARS-CoV-2. Um, we have been doing some feral cat testing, uh, particularly in response to outbreaks on mink farms. And so we have, uh, I have to get clearance to be able to sample the cats, but sometimes we can do intermediate approaches to getting samples from those cats. We, again, we can't keep feral cats out of our traps when we're trying to trap other 
species, um, but sometimes we can do a passive uh, collection to see if there might have been an exposure. We, like we probably wouldn't handle the cat and collect blood, but we might be able to get it to um, take a swab. Um, a lot of times if you just poke a swab through, they're happy to give you a sample by biting your swab. So we, we might be able to do something like that, but that has to be um, determined later because we have to get permissions um, to test feral cats because that's not normal of our our normal agency purview. But we do think that that's a, a very important question. Um, and so whether or not we focus that on that here, uh, I, I can't finalize an answer, but that, that's something we're trying to pursue with other activities. Thanks for the question. Okay, thank you, Susan. Next, we have a caller. Uh, Go ahead, Alicia, you're unmuted. Oh my God, truly. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Yay, okay. So I'm sorry to bother y'all, um, but I am a veterinarian working in Washington State. Um, that is tiny little, well, it's not tiny, but small wildlife rehab on Bainbridge Island. And honestly, um, We've been doing this stuff for a year and a half now. And um, when everything kind of started and moved onward, we, um, me and the state vet were like, okay, so how do we control this on our side? And we started controlling intakes of mustelids and some cervids and felids and, and weasels. And we, we directed everything to different centers. And we tested everything that came in because we were worried that, you know, again, I mean, the mink farm stuff is just on our southern border, right? I mean, that's a big deal. Um, so anyway, we have all the test results from that. And, but I mean, we started to do the quarantine procedures last summer because we were just like, well, you know, this isn't okay. And, you know, this, this year we're looking at cervids we're looking at again mustelids i mean we're containing everything everywhere that we can um so anyway i'm sorry to be such a pain and trying to get on here so many times but it just um this is very important to us and we again this has been on our radar for a very long time um we would love to participate if that's possible. Um, I just, I just think there's so much potential for mutation here, and it really bothers me, and it really scares me, and it does the state that Katie Hammond too. I mean, we both have just had nightmares about this. So, um, anyhow, any thoughts? Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, thanks for that. I'll start by acknowledging um, that that fear you touched on. I think that is uh, shared pretty broadly, and there's frankly a reason that Congress gave us the the financial support and the directive to do this kind of work to kind of help answer those questions. As you point out, um, we're not the only ones doing this, and some folks have been doing this for for quite a while. Um, so. Uh, I should say with regard to this particular project, whether or not we're gonna be collecting, or uh, soliciting rather the samples that folks have in the bank um, is one thing, but one important part of this project is really getting a survey of the landscape and you've given us, I think a really good first, uh, first person to reach out to, to get some of these questions answered because there's a lot of existing information out there. Um, we had a question earlier about, uh, that touched on the importance the value of these samples and how rare they are. If the work exists, we're not looking to recreate that. We really want to build on the important work folks like yourself have done. Um, and like we said, we're looking for a bit of breadth with the, the situations that we're um, trying to figure out, what we're trying to look at here, understand what, um, what risks might be involved. So whether or not, uh, like Laura was saying, we're gonna, we definitely want folks who are interested to reach out. And whether or not each individual facility is picked for for this, and then picking maybe not the right word, or participating in the particular one, we know that everyone in this call is somehow contributing to this. Um, 
can see it, again, providing samples directly, having folks on site, but also contributing to the body of knowledge that we're going to fold into this one. And, and we also know that we're not the keepers of all this. We're going to pass this information right back. And the folks that work with these animals under human care, that work with the wildlife rehabilitation centers, um, we fully expect to make this available to people so they can use it to, to answer their own questions as well. Okay, thank you, Stephen. Next, uh, next question, what are the next steps? We email those two individuals and tell them what species we have, how many individuals, how many samples we have, um, and then we wait to hear whether we've been selected or is there some more formal application process? We don't have anything quite so formal um, at the moment. Uh, like the questionnaire identified, the first step really is to, is to reach out, to send those emails, to, to let us know that you're interested. The survey that we're going to send you after this, I think it's going to all participants and, and probably all registrants, even for the folks that couldn't make today, um, excuse me, we'll start to collect some of that information. But yeah, the first thing is to reach out uh, with some of the basics about your facility. And once we get the the full list of folks who are interested in participating and a couple of the other internal internal uh, things we have to handle will reach out to the facilities that are are going to participate. Um, by all means, if folks have questions in the interim, let us know because, uh, like I said, it could take a little bit before we are actually sending people out and testing samples. And we're frankly all, um, like I just touched on, a bit. Uh, Scared about this virus in general, and want to don't want to um, drag our feet to to get these answers. But also, we're excited to get this thing going. I know that a lot of folks in this call are as well, and don't want to. We do want to build on that momentum. So, again, kind of a long way of saying, first thing, yes, email um, uh, Susan and Jeremy, as was in the slides here, and then look for that post call survey. I'll add to that. Okay, you know, you. just if you give us oh, a, a, yeah, just if, if when you email, if you just give us a very brief introduction to your facility, like if you're a zoo, aquarium, rehab center, or whatnot, um, and just maybe a relative size and whether or not or what type of samples you have available. You know, not not extensive, but just to give us a, a first screen uh, about the nature of the facility, that would be helpful for us to start putting the information to, into a spreadsheet. For some of the zoos that have already um, checked in with us, I, I have a, a spreadsheet chart started and I can usually find a, a reasonable uh, approximation of you know, the kind of animals and the size and, and, and whatnot. So we don't need a ton of details, but just a first sort would be very helpful. Thanks. And, and the information that you'll provide by taking the survey would be really useful to us as well. So the survey, if you're interested in this project, please take the survey that will follow this. Okay, thank you. Next question. What APHIS staff will be involved in this, uh, in the on the ground activities, just animal care? Uh, no, it, 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 it's going to be, uh, will be on the ground, uh, the biosecurity, assessments will be done by Avis personnel, uh, a, a few of whom may be animal care employees who are doing a detail um, to do this particular project. And, but we're also looking at other agencies within Avis to also help with this. So veterinary, we may help some people from veterinary services or wildlife services as a part of that. And then um, Susan's uh, part or the the bio, um, the paradomestic sampling would be carried out by uh, people from wildlife services specifically. Okay, thank you. Next question. Several of the taxon advisory groups are already facilitating uh, serological evaluation of vaccinated animals via virus neutralization testing. Will you be incorporating their results? Yeah, definitely. The TAGs are one of um, the really important groups that we've identified as 
uh, given of as as really holding some important information that'll help inform uh, the results both of this and, and others. Like we we're saying for this particular study, we're looking at around 40 facilities, you know, 30 to 50 facilities, and we know just for the folks on this call, just the people registered for this call, that's representing uh, a subset, maybe half at most. So working with the results that are already out there, things that we already know about these, and some of those groups like the tags that have a really broad reach, we're definitely looking to understand that. And again, not look to retest those, not look to recreate that information. So they are among our first first reach outs to, to understand the landscape of what information there there is and uh, what data have already been collected. Okay, thank you. Next question. Um, I see this is primarily uh, for zoos and aquariums, is APHIS looking at pet store uh, species, uh, example, hamsters? Yeah, thanks for that. We um, have all seen, have been following some of the news out of Hong Kong about hamsters. And like I said earlier, there are some efforts already underway and, and more developing within APHIS to look at companion animals in uh, situations like pet stores. But for this particular study, that is not going to be the focus. We are looking for those exotic animals under human care, um, primarily at zoos and aquariums, as well as touched on um, wildlife facilities, and we have facilities that might also uh, fit the goal for this. Uh, but we're, because of not only the species we're looking at, but also the biosecurity assessment and the kind of risks we're looking to assess, and frankly, the lessons one can learn, they are different enough at a, a pet store from uh, at a zoo and aquarium and wildlife facility uh, to, to have that be a, a different focus. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question, any suggestions or key phrases uh, you would recommend using when sharing this opportunity with upper zoo management who may be very hesitant uh, to allowing USDA personnel to come in and assess biosecurity. Yeah, I totally respect that, and I'll let some of the folks that are more familiar with operations on site on uh, these kind of facilities chime in. And I should say some of this is informed by my my past life as an inspector of high consequence task and research lab, where no one was really happy to see me ever show up. So I understand this perspective. I think one of the important things to stress is that this is voluntary. We are not telling anyone they've got to be part of this. And the other, I think, maybe a little buzzwordy thing is this is collaborative. We're looking to answer the questions that we have, but also the questions that you all have. Um, so understanding that, and again, uh, as I touched on too, none of these results are confirmatory for reporting purposes. So we're going to be very careful with results in line. Again, as, as I was saying, if you're participating in this uh, this step, you're going to have access to your results during the project, but no one else will, not their facilities. The folks on the program, uh, on the project will have access to the breadth of them, but each facility will have access to their results and no one else's. And then with that final report, we are going to take as much care as we can not to identify any individual facility. There, we looking to call out which I'll say again, this is a collaborative project. Um, I hope that those maybe those kind of buzzwords are voluntary and, and collaborative and not reportable, um, hopefully can can get the get the momentum going. Well and just to add oh Jess, did we I think you're muted. Can you hear me now? Okay, great. Um, those are great points, Steve. And I think the other thing I would add um, is, you know, low risk, high reward, because the the zoo or the aquarium doesn't really have to invest anything other than some some potentially precious serum samples, which we understand. Um, but then you would know more about what um, who and what species have been affected in your facility, um, and and get a better handle of biosecurity and, and practice. So. Um, that's our hope. 
the, you know, the thought is that not only would we do biosecurity assessments, some facilities have incredible biosecurity measures in place, and we can <clears throat> all learn from that. And we can also pass that information along to other facilities. And we, we want to see everybody uh, work to improve your biosecurity for the next thing that comes. It, it may not be a pandemic, but it could be an epidemic. It could some, it may not be some other uh, disease process that could affect your zoo collection. So we think that improving biosecurity and sharing information about how best to improve it is a win-win for everybody. Um, it's not the government. We're not looking to uh, enforce any kind of biosecurity measures. We just want to make information available to everyone, find out what their biosecurity was, look at see how they affected the serology samples that we have, um, and, and how to improve it. So those are, we're hoping that it'll be a, a positive process for everyone. Okay, thank you. Next question, would you accept uh, Nabuto strips of dried blood spots? Yes, we, we can take uh, blood, spot, blood spots uh, and Nabuto's in particular. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question, does the technology exist for any serum test to determine strain differences, Delta versus Omicron? It's my understanding that that is not, that technology does not exist, at least our assays are not able to distinguish between the, the virus that um, exposed the animal just showing the, the history of exposure. Do I have that right, Susan? Okay, thank you. Next question. What is the minimal amount of data you would be interested in on samples? I think each sample is going to have to be, you know, tied to a specific animal. Of course, we'll have to know the identity of that animal, at least a way to uh, link it to any other samples from that animal. And then the date um, I don't know if it has to be the very specific date, at least approximate date that that sample was collected. Um, you know, that's going to be important as so we can distinguish every, every sample that's coming in here is going to have to be identified and, and distinguished from the other ones. So tying it to uh, the animal from which it was collected and the date that it was collected will be the, the minimum amount of information we need for each one. Okay, thank you. Next question. Could the link to the survey as well as the contact emails be shared again now for a facility to sign up for the, stir, uh, for the study? I will tell you that uh, a survey will go out to your email uh, following this webinar. Uh, contact information, I think, is available once you submit the survey. Am I correct, Jess? You're you're muted. You're muted Jess. I, I I believe we're, we'll be collecting contact information with the survey. Jess, is that correct? Correct, as far as I know. Yeah, yeah I think they were the asking for your contact information. <laughs> um, well, we pull the survey yeah. heard from you. We, we'll reach out to the, make sure we close mm -hmm. the loop. Okay, thank you. Uh, if facilities are collecting uh, paradomestic animals for injuries that are being euthanized on grounds, would those animals potentially be a source of paradomestic serum data as well? Um, this is another area where we haven't finalized um, what samples we can collect, but I do think that there is the possibility that we'll be able to work with facilities that have rodent control or other paradomestic control programs in place and have the opportunity to get samples that could complement what we're um, actively uh, collecting, but we haven't, we haven't finalized on um, whether or not 
that's something that we can do. We're going to take those two approaches. The intensive sampling will be under research protocol and IACUC, and, um, and so I'll have a little less opportunity to collect opportunistic samples because we're going to be operating under IACUC. Um, and so that, that it, I, I think we just need to put that in the remains to be determined, but we're definitely open to giving that cons some consideration as long as we um, have the capacity to, you know, screen the samples that that would be um, that would work well for us. But the, we have to nail that down whether or not we're going to be allowed to do that. Okay, thank you. Uh, what pair of domestic species are you planning to trap and sample? Uh, so, no, we'll try to get a broad array of common species, but we'll probably focus um, on rodents and mesocarnivores, like skunks, raccoons, um, and those types of species. We'll have limited opportunity for larger species. So, I, I know on some uh, facilities, you might get deer, and that might be of interest, but that's going to be outside the scope of what we'll try to attract. But anything that will fit in our tomahawk traps or rodent traps, um, we'll try to, to sample as long as it's appropriate and covered by our authorizations. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question. Sorry if I missed it, but are you using the same protocol for antibody uh, detection in different animal species? Sorry, I yeah, right, um, uh, so uh, the screening assay that we're using is species independent, and so we'll be using the same assay uh, across species. But that's why I earlier indicated that if we got um, a potential positive with that screening assay, we would want to confirm with virus neutralization um, if we don't have other information uh, for that species. But anyway, it would be the same test, that same screening assay across all species, but we would probably go for corroboration with virus neutralization if there was a species that hasn't had a prior detection. Okay, thank you. Next question, how will you determine which zoos are selected for pair domestic sampling and which ones will be a part of a more intensive sampling? getting a lag and being able to unmute myself. Um, uh, well, we're actually meeting uh, this Friday to kind of finalize our selection criteria. But for the the current, my current thinking on the intensive sampling is because we want to specifically look at, you know, that interface between paradomestics and the zoo animals will probably prioritize larger zoos with some habitat in the near vicinity. Um, where we'll just have the opportunity to collect more species um, and likely where there's uh, a little bit more on the urban end of things just because we want the opportunity for spillover from humans who continue to be the burden of disease, uh, not wildlife or zoo animals. Um, and then for the larger um, study, which we'll do operationally, uh we will i think that's going to be um we'll, we'll try to get a broad array of facilities so um urban and rural large and small and so we'll just base that selection based on the folks who are interested but it would be um interesting in that case to to compare zoos that have a mate or other facilities that have a matrix of habitat and non habitat, because that's probably something that's going to come up in the biosecurity um, assessments that we want to marry to to show that, you know, not that it can necessarily be controlled, but likely an outcome would, we would find that there's more spilled over um, when there's more habitat um, around if there is going to be spillover from wildlife, you know, there's a lot of unanswered questions, but so for the, the broader facilities, we probably just want a, a broad array of um, styles, you know, small, large, urban, rural, and other, and other factors. 
Steve, uh, anyone, anything to add to that? Just a reminder, thinking again about those buzzwords, um, from the beginning that this is going to be voluntary. We're not going to tell anyone they have to participate in the wildlife part of it. So it's going to be based on facility interest as well. Okay, thank you. Um, next, um, this is a comment. International Wildlife Rehabilitation Council would love to help communicate with wildlife rehab centers in any way possible. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, Thanks. we uh, like I said, we're not the only people doing this kind of work, and there's some great existing both work and relationships that we're hoping to tap into, both for for doing the work and getting the word out. Okay. Thank you. Uh, next question: Is there is there a way to share biosecurity information remotely via FaceTime and or sharing of protocols? We haven't figured that part out yet. Um, at present, the plan is still to have APHIS personnel go on site to help answer these questions. Um, there are some things that uh, we as an agency, I think more to, uh, I think we've needed to do a lot of inspection, and this is of course not an inspection, but there's some ways we've been able to adapt um, to do some parts of our, our jobs remotely. It's not yet clear that that's gonna be an option for, for this part of it. Um, as it gets closer, and again, as we start to get a better sense of really the nitty-gritty operational parts of this, um, we'll see if there might be some some leeway there. But again, the plan right now is that if you're participating, it'll be sending the, the serum samples, having APHIS personnel on site to have a conversation to, to talk about some biosecurity questions, and for a subset of the interest folks to do some paradigmatic testing. Okay, thank you. Uh, what will the turnaround time be for results? We have been submitting serum uh, to Cornell to better understand current situation. If we could could spare this cost, uh, would impact motivation to participate. Uh, I, I I can't guarantee turnaround times, but um, we're currently doing some other surveillance activities and our goal is to do sample testing within a week of receiving and then have those reports resulted out within a week of, of the testing. Uh, we wanna make sure that we have any opportunity if we feel like a sample needs to be rerun or retested in an opportunity to QA the data before we release results just to make sure that we're releasing quality information. So uh, we would hope that we could keep that within a, a two week time frame. Um, but you know, obviously sometimes there's some stumbling blocks there, but th those are our goals. And so far we've been in our other activities, we're able to meet those goals. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question, are you considering having access to the sites um, staff medical history regarding SARS-CoV-2 and then try to mirror or compare human and animal situations? So we are not um, looking to get specific information about humans. I think uh, when we have information about the animals, we can maybe discuss what the known risks might have been, but in a broad way, we are not looking to uh, get access to human information, information. I think that's something that as an agency we tend not to um, and, and reasonably so have access to. Um, that said, we are again partnering with some of our other federal agencies and, and some other folks who might have more of an interest in kind of bridging off of the data we have and, and potentially looking into that. But uh, again, we are not looking to compromise any individuals um, uh, information security with with their health information um, with uh, with this particular project. Okay, thank you. Next question. Um, are you interested in the serum samples from the Washington State Lab for the past year regarding regarding otters, weasels, and felids? 
Yeah, certainly. Like I said, we're going to have um, someone in this project, probably not one of the, the folks you see up here, but other other project team members that are going to be devoted to identifying what else has been done already and understanding what results are out there to help us not only interpret our results, but to help focus where we go looking for more. So, um, yeah, certainly. Okay, thank you. I am currently not showing any more questions in the queue and I don't have any hands raised. If you have a question, uh, please put it in the question box. All right, I'm not showing any more questions. Are there any final comments from the from the panelists? Thank you, everybody, for your participation. Um, this has it, it, uh, been a fantastic bunch of uh, uh, questions that hopefully we've been able to answer your most pressing questions. But I thank everyone for your participation. I'd echo that. And, and Dave, just for the last few minutes, are you able to go to the previous slide? Because that has the contact information on it as well, just if anyone wants to jot that down. Um, that would be great. And thank you everyone for your interest and the great questions. Um, again, please take that survey. Um, feel free to reach out um, to Jeremy or Susan. You can see those addresses listed here. Um, if you have any other questions or if you're interested in participating. And um, as Steve mentioned, um, and Dave as well, this presentation will be up on our ACES YouTube site. Um, for anyone that didn't get to participate or see it, or you wanna review something, um, and we hope in some form or fashion to be sending around um, some key points, some summary um, items for anyone that's interested. But thank you. Okay, and I'd like to thank our presenters, Dr. Jessica Siegel Willett, Dr. Stephen Recant, Dr. Lori Gage, Dr. Susan Schreiner, and David Bergman. You will receive a survey following the webinar. We'd appreciate your feedback. It is vital to improve this presentation and provide contact information for those wanting to participate in this project. This webinar uh, is recorded and will be available, as, as Jess said, on the AFIS YouTube channel. Thank you for attending, and that concludes today's webinar.